Hi again. In a History of Christianity by Kenneth Scott Lauderet, he's discussing the resurgence of Arianism after the Council of Nicaea. And Athanasius, who was the great champion of orthodoxy at Nicaea, has been banished. And the story continues. Athanasius took refuge in Rome and was joined there by Marcellus, the then Bishop of Rome, the first of that line to bear the name Julius, took the side of Athanasius and Marcellus. Eusebius and his associates had written Julius, presenting their case and asking him to call a synod or council and be the judge. This Julius did, but the eastern bishops did not come. The synod met in Rome in 340 or 341 and exonerated the two. Anti-Nicene bishops convening in Antioch drew up statements of the faith which they apparently hoped would bridge the widening chasm between them and the supporters of Nicaea, but these did not accomplish that result. In a further attempt to heal the breach, the two emperors, acting at the suggestion of Julius, called a council of the entire church which met at Sardica, the later Sophia, near the border between east and west, probably in 343. Before the council had proceeded to business, the eastern bishops, with Arian sympathies, protesting against the seating of Athanasius and Marcellus, withdrew, perhaps because they saw themselves outnumbered by their opponents. Bishop Hosius of Cordova presided. The council once more examined the charges against Athanasius and declared him innocent, adjudged Marcellus to be orthodox, and ordered the two, along with some others who had been ejected by the Eusebian party, reinstated in their posts. In 346, Athanasius returned in triumph to Alexandria. The Council of Sardica also issued a letter to all the bishops of the Catholic Church reporting its decisions, condemning the Arian views and making a fresh statement of what is it believed the Catholic faith to be. The Council adopted a number of canons, largely disciplinary and administrative, for the regulation of the bishops. Among other acts, the Council of Sardica decreed that if a bishop were deposed, he might appeal his case to the Bishop of Rome, who should take steps to see that it was heard and a decision given. Rome was forging ahead in its leadership in the Catholic Church. Athanasius, as the outstanding champion of Nicene Orthodoxy, was not allowed permanently to enjoy his victory. In 353, Constantius, that is one of the two emperors' sons of Constantine, became the undisputed ruler of the entire empire. His sympathies were clearly pro-Aryan. He sought to achieve unity in the church by bringing the Nicene party and it, the western bishops to heel. Councils were called at Arles in Gaul in 353 and in Milan in 355. At the latter, a tumultuous scene ensued, yet the bishops were constrained to come into accord with their eastern colleagues. Athanasius was again sent into exile, 356, although this was spent chiefly in Egypt. For refusing to comply with the imperial wishes, Liberius, the bishop of Rome, Hosius of Cordova, and one other were also exiled. At a council held in Sirmium, the imperial residence in 357, the second to assemble there, the bishops, some of them clearly dominated by the Arian emperor, put forward a creed which explicitly forbade the use of usia, homousia, and homoousius. Let me read that again. So homousia and homoousia, the words that are pertaining to the dispute over the nature of Christ. On the grounds, as was the customary reason advanced by the Arians, that these were not to be found in the scriptures. Thus, the distinctive phrase of the Nicene Creed was condemned. Apparently, the extreme Arians were impatient with the long efforts to dodge the basic issue between themselves and the Nicene Party by the utilization of words which could be interpreted in more than one way, and believed themselves to be strong enough to come out unequivocally with their own position and to force through its acceptance by the entire Catholic Church. Hosius, said now to be a centenarian, signed the creed, but it was alleged, it is alleged rather, only that only after he had been brought to the council against his will and had been beaten and tortured. 
there is some ground for belief, although this has been warmly debated, that under the stress of exile, Bishop Liberius of Rome also assented to the Arian position. Obedient councils held in several cities in the next few years concurred. Outwardly, the unity of the church had been restored. The official term for the relation of the son to the father was homois, similar. That is, the son is like the father, not of the same nature anymore. This was the the new word that was fashionable to describe their relationship. And Lorette, Latteret concludes this subsection by saying, the issue was complicated by the relations between the church and the state. The Arians would have the church submit to the emperor. The Nicene party insisted on the autonomy of the church as against the Arian rulers. Next section is the defeat of the Arians. I'll put in a link to Louis Burkhoff, the great Reformed theologian, his analysis of the development of the Trinity Doctrine, which is the first of several videos by Burkhoff. <clears throat>